Once we have introduced the programming language we'll use, we can introduce now the second topic of this course, machine learning. But before we'll do that, I just want to prepare a bit the work by clarifying a little bit of terminology. And in particular, here you see I have a question for you. Do you believe, do you think that a pocket calculator, one of these very old style uh, pocket uh, calculator like this one in this figure, where you can make uh, some very basic operations, maybe here there is the square root, but not much more than that. So do you think that this calculator should classify for artificial intelligence? Does it represent an example of uh, artificial intelligence or not? Well, I admit that it would be hard that you answer positively today when we have machines much more intelligent than a pocket calculator. And luckily, you would be right, in the sense that the definition of artificial intelligence is a bit unusual, in the sense that it is based on uh, comparisons with uh, human intelligence. Let's hence go into see some definitions of artificial intelligence that I took from some leading online dictionaries. So the first definition is the theory and development of computer systems able to perform tasks normally requiring human intelligence, such as, and then it gives some examples visual perception, speech recognition, decision making and translation between languages. And this was the Oxford Dictionary. If we follow the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, artificial intelligence is either a bunch of uh, computer science dealing with the simulation of intelligent behaviors in computers or the capacity of machines to again imitate intelligence human behaviors. Finally, for Cambridge, it is the study of how to produce machines that have some of the qualities that the human mind has, such as, and again, it provides a, a list, a, a very heterogeneous list, understand languages, recognize pictures, solve problems, learn, so I went through all these definitions. What can we take from them? The first consideration is that the definitions are given in relation, in comparison to human intelligence. Then the problem is to define what is intelligence, what uh, represent an intelligent behavior. And here you find another definition of intelligent agents that is a bit more pragmatic, but only a little bit, and it doesn't depend on human, on a comparison on human intelligence. Intelligence is defined rather in the capacity, I would say, to adapt to the environment, sensing and acting over it to achieve the agent's own, uh, own goal. My take is that intelligence can be taught as the capacity to adapt applied at the scale of the individual uh, organism. But the reference to what normally requiring human intelligence raises a problem. The bar of the definition of intelligence changed with time. What normally required human intelligence is a frequentist approach. You count, 99% of the time you need human intelligence, this device don't, hence the device is deemed intelligent. I am sure that when the first numerical calculators arrived, a pocket calculator like the one in the previous slide would have satisfied this frequentist definition. But obviously not today. So the first problem we have with this term is that what classify as intelligence change with time. It is actually very close to the concept of innovative. 
The second problem is that it still remains very vague. Note that all the definitions don't give which are the characteristics of the set or what really discriminate between being in the set of artificial intelligent device or not. Rather, it lists the individual items, what is included in the set, what is considered artificial intelligence, so recognizing pictures is in, performing language translation, also uh, making a product. No, that one, no, we no longer classify as artificial intelligence machines that can uh, compute products like uh, pocket calculators. Also, certainly being able to do arithmetic is one of the most dis distinguishable features of human intelligence. So it's something that I personally prefer not to use too much. It is an expression that I don't like too much. It has been coined in the 50s during the search of the first large mainframes, large in the physical sense that could easily fill a whole room. Then soon there has been a stronger disillusion about the actual capabilities uh, of these new machines. That the era where the robots will rule the world is not actually so close and the term has been uh, almost uh, abandoned to then finally return but only in terms of specific aspects of what was considered artificial intelligence. So what happened more recently is that some specific fields of what was called artificial intelligence had undergone a revival. We will discuss machine learning as a field of artificial intelligence and you will see in a moment in the next slide that its definition is much more coherent, much more narrowed. But one last note. A complete discussion of artificial intelligence or of machine learning should also comprise a chapter of the associated ethical issues. However, in this course we will not discuss any ethical issue. In the first instance, because I do not feel qualified to speak about ethical issues in general. And secondly, because it is an important but also very vast topic. And I think that this would require a course on its own. But it's important that you consider that the use of artificial intelligence think to the machine learning algorithms that we will uh, see, will open the issues of what is ethical. Many models, the way they are trained, they reflect and amplify the biases of the society rather than reduce them. If your training data is biased, this bias can make its way into your machine learning model. The output that you may obtain from these models and the decisions you take based on this output are not necessarily in line with the ethics of the society. So these are very important issues and uh, I invite you to document by yourself about these issues but will not be part of the course. The term machine learning is still somehow vague but much less than artificial intelligence. So as we did it for artificial intelligence, let's see its definition as reported in the dictionaries. So the first one from Oxford is the use and development of computer systems that are able to learn and adapt without following explicit instructions by using algorithm and and statistical models to analyze and draw inferences from patterns in data. We can see here already some important concepts. The first one is that machine learning algorithm should be generic. They shouldn't be problem specific, should not include domain specific instructions, but should learn the problem 
resolutions from the data. For example, for the digit recognition exercise that we will see, I could have created a, a computer program that says, one, identify the lines by checking for the variation in pixel darkness in a certain direction, and when it is higher than a certain value, okay, it is a line. Step two, assign the label one if you can find a vertical bar in the center of the image without any other lines in the middle. Well, then I have to define the tolerance for both uh, what is vertical and what is center and, and so on. You can see it is going to be complex. This is not machine learning. Rather, machine learning should learn all these tasks from the data itself. Second, nothing forbid us to use statistical models as algorithms. We will see some of them during the course, but this is not required. We don't need to make any probabilistic assumption concerning the distribution of our data, aside to respect that what we train our model with is the same as what we use it for. We will see this, don't worry if for now training a model doesn't tell you much. The point is that the algorithm is tested, is evaluated on its goodness for the objective, mostly doing good predictions, not on specific assumptions, even when we use a statistical model. Let's continue with the definitions. So for uh, Merriam-Webster, it is the process by which a computer is able to improve its own performance, and here he give uh, a, an example, by continuously incorporating new data into an existing statistical model. This is essentially the same concept that is given by the Cambridge Dictionary. The process of computers changing the way they carry out tasks by learning from new data without a human being needing to give instructions in the form of a program. So again, we do not need to make some specific assumptions to program explicitly a machine learning algorithm. The key is the data. The algorithm must learn from the data. But there is also here in these two last definitions this emphasis on continuous learning from new data. I would like to stop one second on this because I do not feel much for machine learning this need to online algorithms. It's true, many machine learning algorithms, they are online algorithms, but it isn't necessarily true for all machine learning algorithms. Online algorithms are algorithms that do not require the data they process to be available at the beginning of the algorithm, of the computation. But instead, they adjust, they correct their output as the data become available to them. Let's consider a simple example. In this file, I have included an example of an online algorithm. What is an online algorithm? In an online algorithm, the data is processed as it arrives rather than having it available at the beginning of the computation. Let's consider the operation to take the average. Normal mean function here performs the mean given a vector that it receives as an input. This is a traditional, not an online algorithm. It just compute the sum and divide by the number of elements. By the way, obviously Julia has its own mean function and the way it is implemented here is very naive. It doesn't pretend to be at all an example on how to best code it, but it is very simple. The problem with an algorithm like this one, or ever, is that it can manage only data that is small enough, enough to be stored in memory, in the physical memory of the computer doing the computation. And of course, data must be available at the beginning of the computation. So here I define the function, here I create some data, a vector x, 
and here I can call uh, the function. The result is uh, free, no surprise about this. Here I rearranged my algorithm as an online one. To the online mean function, I pass the old mean, the old cardinality, and the new data that is becoming available. I obtain as a result a new mean and a new cardinality. Again, it is almost surely more efficient to work directly with the sum rather than the mean and compute the mean only when is needed. But this, to, this is to show the algorithm in, in, in its simple form. Here in this function, we use the online version of the algorithm to compute the mean of the data stored in a file. So we open the file here and then for each line, we call the online mean function. Potentially, this file could be very big, petabyte of data. Still, it will be processed line by line, with the mean getting updated as the file uh, get processed. We will see the details of the uh, element presented in this code during the course. While online algorithms are less exigent in time of memory, may be more computationally expensive. This is a common trade-off in programming and more in general in computations. During some computation, you may want to store the results, some data for further operations rather than recompute it from scratch, but you need to allocate some memory space for this data, this temporary data that you save. Many machine learning algorithms can indeed be trained with new data and refine their predictions as the training continue. But it is also common to have a large set of data, train the algorithm with that data, and then do all the predictions. So I don't feel for it to be an element that characterizes so much machine learning. You heard already prediction several times. So yes, prediction is a key scope. Although not the only one of machine learning, we'll see other kind of machine learning tasks in a couple of slides. But it is undisputed that prediction is where machine learning shines, where there has been the greatest successes and the most practical applications. In its most simple uh, way, the machine learning algorithms learns a relation between some X and the Y based on same data. This is the training step of the algorithm I was referring to earlier. Once the model is trained, you use it to produce predictions based on other data and the algorithm is evaluated on how far these predictions are from the real Y. If you start to notice that the predictions are no longer good enough, you need to train again to the new data that you have. You may object that not everything, especially in economics, relates to predictions. Actually, very few economic problems are predictions. Most of the time, we are interested to understand how something works. Uh, to check if the data supports a given theoretical economic model rather than making predictions. I claim instead that many times making predictions is the final scope of an economic task, even if this doesn't seem evident. You can treat most problems as prediction problems, and we'll see an example next slide. But why machine learning now? Why this revival of this specific aspect of artificial intelligence? There are three pillars underpinning the machine learning boom. The first one is the algorithm foundations. So one aspect is that the algorithms that uh, have, been have been improved. We managed to find algorithms that are 
empirically very good in generalizing a problem, in finding the relation between the X and the Y in general terms, and not restricted to the data that has been used for training the model. The second aspect is the data availability. Machine learning requires a lot of data. Often predictions become good only if the data the model are trained with is large enough. And the availability of data to train the algorithms has exploded with the digitalization of the society. We are now able to collect a large amount of data, including personal data. Again, this opens a lot of issues on the field of the privacy that are not discussed in this course, but are important. Finally, we have the algorithms and we have the data. The last point is that only recently we obtained the means to handle them, to process these huge amounts of data and run the algorithms over them. Think about the graphical processing units, for example, or the democratization of cloud infrastructures. So it is the combination of these three factors together that hallowed for the rapid development of machine learning techniques in everyday aspects of the society.